Bread. Blunt. Dough. Moolah. Dosh. Loot. Jack. Rhino. Bobbies. Fondulies. Mopus. Dust. Salt. Chink. Oof. Brass. Bread. Blunt. Dough. Moolah. Dosh. Loot. Jack. Rhino. Bobbies. Fondulies. Mopus. Dust. Salt. Chink. Oof. Brass. The, the Reddies, pin money, pocket money, cold heart, cash. I'm an artist, so I can fit into almost any society. I can be with kings and queens. I have manners. <laughs> Classy. My mother was Slovak. She had Czechish airs. It was very important for her to give me brains, beauty, and breeding. Those were her three Bs. Once, as a child, I remember going into a store with my mother, and my mother handed the lady one piece of money, and the lady handed her back several. And I was astounded. Mommy, how could that happen? She gave you back so many. You only gave her one. You know, in Portugal, it was very clear you were poor or you were rich. There's only recently a middle class in Portugal. You'd hear people say, Enrica, she's rich. And then they would be like, E muito pobre, she's very poor. And usually it was she was very poor, not he was very poor. <laughs> And she was poor because there wasn't a man around to help. So we would bring her food. And those things stay with you. When I was in third grade, we moved from Palisades Park, which was a Catholic town, Irish and Italian Catholic, to Teaneck, which was almost entirely Jewish. And Teaneck was a huge change. I remember a kid asking me, how much property does your father have? <laughs> property? I didn't know what property was, but he's got 10 properties in his workshop. And Teaneck was a place where women wore mink stoles to Rosh Hashanah. In September, mink, I was an early refusenik. I have read, psychically read, by some of the richest people in the world. They've been in this little tenement building. They've sat in that chair. Last week, I had two princesses, the mother and the daughter. Princesses, talk about rich. <laughs> I love this little place. It's beautiful. It's bohemian. <laughs> they, they come from palaces. And I have this little bathtub in my kitchen. But you know, I'm not embarrassed anymore because I have my knowledge, my wisdom. That's my bag of gold. That's my gift. I'll never forget the differences in our worlds, but their money will never buy what I know and who I am. I always hide money. I'd leave a little here, a little there, like singles and five dollar bills. I have twenty dollars in my car, so if I need gas, I always feel like I have money. <laughs> I used to say to the kids, when they'd have cabin fever in the winter, I'd say, okay, go on a money hunt. And they'd look in all my pockets, they'd search all over the house, and so we'd have enough for Maybe a pizza, maybe a movie, maybe just an ice cream. But sometimes we found a lot of money and we went for pizza and a movie and invited another kid. So you never feel like you're broke. When I first met Rob, I used to bet on horses all the time. And then I got into football, so I started betting on football. I was really good at it. But we went to a bar one night and Rob said, you know, this makes me really uncomfortable. 
So I put the books away and I didn't do it. I didn't gamble for many, many years. And then one winter I went down to Florida and my cousin Keith taught me how to play poker. He took me to the casino where his wife worked and I did great because it's all about percentages and numbers plus reading people's part of my job. So the poker table was like this one big happy family and I was good at it. I kept at it for a year and a half. We started talking about divorce just before Passover. I went to the vault to get out my engagement ring and it wasn't there. So I went home and I said to Howard, I can't imagine what happened, but my engagement ring is not in the vault. And he said, no, I took it. And I remember thinking, was it mine or was it his? It was just the most upsetting. I can still feel it as if somehow being struck in the stomach. I said, what do you mean you took it? And he said, well, I had it appraised. I'm probably going to sell it. I'm going to need the money. What was upsetting was that something I had thought of as mine wasn't mine. And I realized that the house we lived in was his. And that in a real sense, I was a non-person. He was getting on with his life, and mine was over in his eyes. It was very brutal, very brutal. My mother's very thrifty and careful with money, while my father was more extravagant and kind of reckless. My brother is a nitwit about money, always lived beyond his means, lost his business, went bankrupt, his house was repossessed. Out in the world, what I mostly see is that men have more access to money. Women get left carrying the burden. Just because they bear the children and are responsible for them, they get slowed down. But it's still a very true fact that women make less money than men. And that's still true, even today. Then one day, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't lie and hide and cheat one moment more. It took me a long time to pay back the money, but I did, and the burden was on me and nobody else. And people say to me, well, are you gonna do it again? And I say, nah, I am so over it. But that doesn't mean I'm not capable of getting obsessed about something else. But I hear from gamblers who tell me I can't stop. And I say, yes, you can, and you will. One day you will. You know, I don't really spend much in any discretionary way, because why start? I could find I have a genius for extravagance, and then could be let down and just disappointed so much of the time. I could really get in touch with a lot of financial insecurity. But I don't choose to go there. It's sad, and it's true. In hard times, fortune tellers flourish. <laughs> we are what I call the last chance Texaco, the last gas station on the highway. When there's nowhere left to go, you come to us. There's a card in the weight deck called the Five of Pentacles. It shows two people passing in front of the church, two beggars in the snow. And many of the wealthy people who come here choose that card. And I know, I know they have nothing. We're poor, poor in spirit. They have money, you can see the coins. They're like beggars in the snow. I have a lot of friends who've been in trouble about money and I know I could have. I could have been one of those people. I could have lost everything. I could have lost our house and our business. I could have lost Rob's shop. So I'm grateful every day that I didn't, that I, didn't take it that far. I always thought of myself as very lucky. My parents gave me good manners, good education, a good head on my shoulders. And they left me a warm fuzzy, money. It was not massive, never massive, but I always walked around as if I had all the money in the world. You don't have any money? I'll take you out. Because I always felt and believed 
that that was correct, the correct behavior, that I had abundance. My grandfather's saying was, if you're ever feeling poor or down on your luck, give something away, help somebody else, and you'll feel rich. You'll be rich indeed. Across the whole of the American continent, the talk of money is never quiet. 24 hours a day, it seeps through the walls and shouts on the floors of the exchanges. Whispers in darkened bedrooms and clatters in all-night restaurants. It pleads and wheedles through telephone lines, takes up most of the space in the media, screams across kitchen tables, worries in elevators, makes crazy the would-be artists in the gloom of the avant-garde. Nobody ever has enough. Legal tender, women and the secret life of money. 